So just pray that the priest gets himself ready to bring us the word. Lord Jesus, thank you for, for these words. Lord, please open our minds and our hearts to truly understand. And then may you move our, our wills so that we are uh, eager to obey. So I just want to commit this time to you. Pray for priests, Lord. I pray that your spirit will move through him. In Jesus' name. Yeah. How many of you want to do something that's meaningful? Everyone? I think? Yeah. We all want to do something. It's really important, isn't it, to do something meaningful. Um, there's a, you, you see it in young kids. I reckon part of the reason why young kids ask the question why is because they're already craving meaning, even as a young child. Like, why? Why am I doing this? And then you see it, uh, I suppose, in teenagers. For those of you that have had teenagers over the summer, I'm bored. I'm bored. They want to do something that's meaningful, something that's significant. And then, of course, uh, you see it at work. There's a, there's a bunch of classic studies that have been done which just confirm what we knew anyway, but you need to do a scientific study in order to believe it. Um, when work is meaningful, productivity goes up, satisfaction goes up, health goes up, motivation goes up, and then the opposite is true. And if you're doing a job that's not intrinsically meaningful, then, then you need to invent a reason why it is meaningful or the business needs to reframe it. So, so meaning is really important to us. We want to be part of something that's going to last. Like building sandcastles is fun, but you don't invest a whole lot of time in it, do you? Because it's going to get washed away, yeah? Well, God has given us that desire to be part of something that's meaningful, and in his kindness, he's given us the ability to be part of something that is the most important thing, of utmost significance to him, something that's eternal in terms of how long it's going to last and something that is of incredible value to him. And that's the building up of his people, the, the building up of his church, the making of disciples, which is what we've been thinking about over these last, last few weeks. This is something that not only lasts for eternity, but it's something that is of incredible value to him. Do you remember at the end of the book of Revelation that we looked at last term, uh, we saw there that the church, the people of God, the disciples of Jesus are represented as a beautiful bride. Or if that doesn't float your boat, and if you're more of the engineering type, it's, it's of an incredible city full of gems and precious jewels. This is, it, it, it's a metaphor which shows the incredible worth that, the, that God places on his people and on the church. And then, of course, there's the image of it, us being a temple, being formed together in which he will dwell by his spirit. Now, if you're not convinced that this is of incredible value, just, just the reality that Jesus sent his son to die for people. We are the blood-bought people of Christ. That shows you the incredible value that he places on the making of disciples, of the, the building of his church. And so when you're entrusted with a job that's really important, you take it as important, special. Yeah? Like you, a friend asks you to care for their dog or for their pet plant called Wilbur. Um, you, you take great care of it then, don't you? Uh, our neighbours are going away and they've asked us to feed their dog. We want to do that well. We don't want their dog to die. Yeah? When you're entrusted with something that's precious, the meaning goes up. Well, God has entrusted all of us to you. If you ever wanted to be a part of something that's important and meaningful, this is it. And it's something that we can all be part of. It's not just for the select few. It's something we can all be part of. So the teenager that says, I'm bored, well, there is actually something that you can be part of that is full of meaning and significance. And, and we don't have to try and find something that's meaningful to do with our life. It's here. God has given it to us. So the question we want to grapple with is how? How do we participate in this? 
And how do we see it happen? And I'm about you that I feel often a bit like a first year apprentice that's been entrusted with a task that's way beyond me. Yeah? And so we, we want to ask the question, how? how? How do we do this? How do we participate in the making of disciples? So I want to boil this down for you into something that's really tangible, really achievable, something that you can be part of and see how you can be part of, but we're going to go on a bit of a journey to get there. I know some of you would just appreciate me getting straight to the answer, and I will do that. Okay. But others of you want the rationale. And for all of us, it's really good for us to dig into God's word and keep wrestling with what he has given to us there and listening to what he says. Yeah? So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to look at what is a disciple, who makes disciples, and then how. Okay, so there's the journey. We're going to recap a little bit of what we've done, and then we're going to get to the practical. So two weeks ago, we looked at what. What is a disciple? And so you don't uh, tune out, I want you to try and remember that from two weeks ago. And if you weren't here, you'll probably have an answer to that question anyway. And again, I'm going to get you to say something to the person next to you. So you've got 30 seconds. What can you remember from two weeks ago about what a disciple of Jesus is? And if you can't remember, then just what's, what's the answer you have right now? What is a disciple of Jesus on your marks? Get set. Go. 30 seconds. seconds. All right. Dave was sitting on his own, so he's going to stand up and share to everyone else what... No, I'm not going to do that to you. Um, <laughs> what is a disciple of Jesus? Lots of ways you could answer that question, but boiling it down... It's someone, here's my summary for you, someone who has received Christ. A disciple is made when they receive Christ. So there's that sense of that's when they become a disciple of Jesus, disciple made, but there's also that ongoing aspect of someone who learns Christ and someone who loves Christ. So someone who's received Christ, someone who is learning to live with Christ as their Lord, and someone who is learning to love him more than anything else. That's what we want to see in making a disciple. Now, I've done that partly to remind you of what a disciple is, but also because I think it helps you to understand how a disciple is going to be made. How does someone receive Christ? Well, they won't receive Christ unless they've heard the good news about Jesus, the gospel, yeah? And so until they've heard the good news about the, the love of Jesus and the lordship of Jesus, then they haven't got a chance to become a disciple. So if you have a look at Romans chapter 10, we are going to be bouncing around in our Bibles a bit. So Romans chapter 10, verse 14, uh, the Apostle Paul there says... How can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them or speaking to them? And how can they anyone preach unless they're sent? Well, we've already seen that in the, in the Great Commission that we're all sent. So the question I'm wrestling with is how does a person become a disciple of Jesus? Verse 17 is particularly what I want you to look at. Consequently, faith... That is the faith that saves a person, the faith that, that God credits to them as righteousness, the faith that, that they put in Jesus, who is their Lord and Saviour. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. What's that word about Christ? It's the message about Jesus, who is Lord and Saviour, the one who died on the cross, took our place on the cross, took our sin to the cross, nailed it there, took the wrath of God upon himself and exchanged our sin for his righteousness. Faith comes from hearing the gospel message. 
But the faith that saves, we will see in a minute, is also the faith that grows the believer. So how are disciples made? Through the gospel message. If you want to see it again, come with me to Acts chapter 14, verse 21. And I've chosen that one, not because it's the only time it appears in the book of Acts, it's repeated right through the book of Acts, but it's right back, smack bang in the middle of the book of Acts and kind of represents the whole. Acts chapter 14, verse 21 says this. They, that is Paul and Barnabas, preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. So as the gospel is spoken and proclaimed, disciples are made. And the book of Acts is the story of that. So the book of Acts is punctuated, you know, before they had chapters and verses, they used a repeated phrase to kind of be like landmarks through the book of Acts. And that repeated phrase is, as the word grew, the church grew. As the gospel was spread, disciples were made. The book of Acts is just that story. That as the word of God was spoken into the lives of people, the church grew. So what is a disciple? Someone who has, say, received Christ, they've failed. They're learning Christ and they love Christ. How does that come about? Through the gospel. That's what a disciple is. Who? Who makes disciples? Now we were going to look at this in depth last week, but we had a baptism which was great, and that fits right into the Great Commission. Go and baptise them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. So we didn't get to dig into the who as much as I want to. So here's a crash course, okay? Who is making disciples? Well, who did Jesus commission to make disciples? Go on, audience participation. Who, who did Jesus commission? His disciples. He commissioned all of his disciples to go and make disciples. So disciples make disciples, yeah? Disciple making is the responsibility of each and every disciple of Jesus. It's not something for the elite few. It's not something for a program that sits outside. It's not something that is done separate from. It's not an optional extra as if, you know, well, I'm a Christian, but you're a disciple maker. Disciples make disciples. Jesus commissions them in Matthew chapter 28. If you go back into Matthew chapter 16 and 18, there he calls the disciples his church. What we're wrestling with here is, is the making of disciples the responsibility of the individual or of the whole? Now, I was going to... I am. I'm going to get volunteer. I'm going to get Angus. Sorry, mate, you shouldn't have sat in the front row. I want you to stand here. Sorry about this, the wind. So now face the people. I'm going to introduce you to Angus. This is my friend Angus. And unfortunately for the purposes of this exercise, whilst he's standing here, Angus is not a Christian. Not a believer. Doesn't know Jesus. It's all right, we'll get there. Okay, so trust me. Yep. He's not a believer, doesn't know Jesus. But now, come over here, Angus. I want you to stand here. Oh, I'm going to step back. You stand there. This is my new friend, Angus. He's a disciple of Jesus. He's received Christ. He's learning to live with Christ as his Lord. And he loves Christ. Yep. Come back over here. Okay, back to old Angus. Angus doesn't know Jesus. Brought up in Australia. You, didn't, you weren't brought up in Thailand. He's brought up in Australia. And has that common understanding of Christianity that it's pointless, irrelevant, backward, harmful. And Jesus is, well, maybe he lived, maybe he didn't. But I don't really care because he's irrelevant to my life now. There are many religions, but we're probably better off with no religion. This is Angus. Okay, what is going to move Angus to the right? 
This is our left. Yeah, but it's the right. <laughs> What's going to move Angus to the right? Well, first of all, he needs to meet someone. He has to have contact with someone who knows Jesus. Yeah? Let's say that happens. Move just a little step to the right. Then that person has to build a connection with him. Yeah? They have to build a, a relationship sufficient enough for them to be able to communicate about Jesus. Move one step to the right. Let's say that happens. And a person communicates the truth about Jesus to Angus. And Angus is interested, but he's got lots of questions. Lots of questions. Move one step to the right. We're going to run out of room. You're going to be a super Christian by the time we finish. Um, <laughs> one step to the right. No, stay there. Um, lots of questions. Who's going to answer those questions for him? And every time he has those questions answered, he's going to need to hear the gospel again in a new light and deeper and fresher each time. Move one step to the right. At some point, someone has to call Angus to repentance and faith. 2 Corinthians, where Paul says, We are ambassadors for Christ and we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. So, so who's going to call him to repentance and faith? Well, let's say that happens and Angus, praise God, puts his faith in Jesus. One step to the right. He's now received Christ, but he now needs to be established as a believer. He needs to learn how to read the Bible. He needs to learn how to uh, deal with sin in his life. He needs to know how to apply the grace of God to his life. He needs to learn how to obey Jesus day by day. One step to the right. He needs to learn about belonging, part of his church, and the significance of that and the meaning of that. One step to the right. He also needs to be trained to be involved in ministry. Serving one another in love. That's lots, isn't it? You can go sit down there, mate. I'm going to ask you a question. Which ones of you could do all of that? Now, you may come across people that could have a hand in every part of that process. But it really is beyond any one of us to be responsible for that whole process. It's not something that one of us can bear the responsibility for in its entirety, but it's something that we all have responsibility for. But at that point, I just want to throw in, if the goal of Christian ministry as a church is for for us to raise up everyone so that everyone is competent in being able to lead a person for, through that whole process, then I think we're going to fail, yeah? And that's where it's really important to get the answer to the question, who? Right. Who is making disciples? Because the answer to the who question could be, you could answer it, well, it's only the competent ones that can be responsible for this process. And I'm just going to take a back seat while those ones do the work of disciple making. The responsibility ought not be carried by any one individual, and yet it's every individual's responsibility. And that's why Jesus has commissioned a body. To make disciples. It's interesting the number of times that the New Testament moves from unpacking the gospel message to the theology of church and then to the life of a body together. And I want to give you a couple of examples. I don't know, we haven't got time for one example. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Now, I could have gone to Romans chapter 12, does the same thing. I could have gone to 1 Corinthians or 1 Peter, and I reckon the case can be made in 1 Thessalonians and Philippians. But Ephesians, it's really clear. Ephesians chapter 4, prior to Ephesians chapter 4, you've got three chapters of pure theology. There is not a single command in the first three chapters of the book of uh, Ephesians. Ephesians 1 is about the full and free grace that has been won for us by Jesus. Chapter 2 and 3 are the outcome of that grace, which is salvation and an understanding of the church. Chapter 4, verse 1, comes to the very first command, and that is to live and walk in light of the grace that's been given to you in Christ. 
the calling that you've received. It's a calling of grace. Now immediately you think, right, now we're going to get into how we're to live. And immediately it goes into body life together. How to live as a body of Christians. What I'm getting at is that the gospel comes through Jesus. He commissions his disciples to make disciples. And the way that is going to happen is through the body serving one another in love. Have a look at Ephesians 4 verse 13. Here's the goal. Paul says, Until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So, so this is making disciples. We want to see people grow and become mature, yeah? In the knowledge of the Son of God. How's that going to happen? Who's doing this? Verse 11 and 12. He mentions five people in verse 11, five categories of people, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. But then he says that they are to equip his people, people, for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So how is the body of Christ going to be built up? By people serving one another. Yeah. So as the body serves, as each person is gifted, verse 7, disciples are made and the body is built. So who makes disciples? The body. But the body is made up of individuals. So each individual, you need to take responsibility for the growing of each other. But we do this as part of a whole. Now that whole pathway that Angus was working on is going to be filled with various people doing various aspects at different points in time. And we're all on that pathway. But we're all in a position where we can move one step to the right and where we can encourage another person to move one step to the right. We all have a responsibility in that. Now you're all still with me. I know it's hot. Stay with me. So we've done what? We've thought about who. Now we're going to come to how. How does this happen? What are the things that we are called to do that will contribute to people moving one step to the right? I want you to keep the finger in Ephesians 4, but come back to Matthew chapter 28. And notice something about the commission itself, or this particular commission in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus tells us how in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. He says, Therefore go and make disciples, baptising them in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So there's two things that particularly we're told to do, which is to baptise and to teach. Now the baptising has particularly to do with a person receiving Christ, And the teaching them has particularly to do with them learning about Christ and learning to live with Christ as Lord, learning to love Christ. Yeah? We're to teach them, but we're to teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. Now, some of your Bible translations would, in fact, the more common translation is to observe everything he commanded. And the word carries the sense of obey, but also that there there are more than just explicit commands that Jesus gives that we are to go along with. There's a way of thinking, a way of seeing the world. So, So we're to teach not just to inform, but to transform, to see people's lives transformed by the good news about Jesus. Yep. God's plan is for his life, his holiness, the fruit of his spirit to grow in the life of all of his people. And in essence, that's what the rest of the New Testament is, about teaching people about Jesus and training people to love Jesus. The Old Testament anticipates all that and the fulfilment of that in the person of Jesus. So we're all to teach the word of God, but all times through the message of his grace. Now I mentioned 
grace again because I've just lost my spot. I mention the gospel of God's grace again because the gospel which saves is the same gospel which grows people. Remember Romans chapter 10 said, faith comes from hearing the gospel message. The faith that saves is the same faith that will grow a person. And that faith only comes through the message of the grace of Christ. Jesus says we're to teach, but you've got to ask what's the content of what we're to teach. It says all that he commanded, which is partly in the Gospels, but it's also what's in the rest of the New Testament as the apostles went and obeyed what Jesus did. So when we come to the rest of the New Testament, there's one message that is taught again and again and again, and that is the good news of Jesus as Lord and Saviour. The good news about the cross And it's this message that grows people. The book of Acts, as the word grew, the church grew. So come with me to Titus chapter 2, verse 11. We'll come back to Ephesians 4 before we close. I'm realising now I've chewed off way too much for you guys, but hopefully you can stay with me. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. The gospel which saves is the gospel which grows. We're asking the question, how? What, What are we to do that's going to lead people to grow? Verse 11 comes after Paul has said, teach the men to live self controlled lives, the women to live self controlled lives, uh, you know, across every facet of life. And then he says, for the reason we're to do that is because the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And then verse 12, it says, it teaches us. So the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives. So a disciple of Jesus is someone who obeys Christ, yeah? Yeah? Disciple of Jesus is someone who is learning to love Christ and therefore to obey him. They're learning to say no to ungodliness and to live self-controlled lives. But what's the fuel for that? What is it that will teach them to do that? It's not going to be the expectations of another. It's not going to be law. It's not going to be legislation. Another way to ask our question is, What will fuel love of Jesus? What will lead a person to obey Jesus? What's the foundation for learning a self-controlled life? The grace of God given to us through Jesus. The gospel of God's free and full grace available through Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1 says, The message of the cross is the power of God. There's a song that we sing. What will wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And the next line is, what will make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's this message that will transform an unbeliever into a believer and will transform an immature believer into a mature believer. And here's the good news. As you open your Bible, you'll see this message taught again, 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 and again. The Old Testament looks forward to it. It's fulfilment in the person of Christ. Every page in the New Testament, it's there. This is what we're to teach. This is what will fuel growth. We're to teach the Word of God understood in the light of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. Now, you may be sitting there and still thinking that that seems like that's something that only a few can do, right? Now, come back to Ephesians chapter 4. 
There's just two verses there. Ephesians chapter 4. We saw the goal in verse 13 is to become mature. We saw that uh, that will happen as everyone serves in verse 11 and 12. Verse 14, it will mean that we're not tossed around at, by false gospels. But come to verse 15. Here's our job. Here's something that everyone can do. And this is what we're called to do as individuals as part of this body. Verse 15, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. Right, I'm going to get you to do something. I want everyone to stand up. Do this right now. Everyone, stand up. Judy's like, oh, fair dinkum. <laughs> Stand up. Take a deep breath. All right, sit down. My wife's saying, Chris, why are you doing this? I'm going to give you the short version of my sermon. It's good to see everyone here today. Today we're thinking about how to make disciples of Jesus. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to see there that how we make disciples of Jesus is to speak God's truth in love and to serve in love. Read verse 15 and 16 with me. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in him, uh, sorry, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. How are disciples made? If you're a Christian, you can do this. All of you can do this and all of you can grow in this. And as you do this, disciples will be made for the glory of God. The body of Christ will grow. You will speak the truth in love. What truth are you speaking? The truth of the gospel message into people's lives. Now, as a body, we can do this in a million different ways. I told you before we're going to get practical. Here's a I'm just going to throw at you a whole bunch of different ways this can happen. After the last song that we're about to sing, we could uh, chat afterwards and we could talk about the weather. And that would be right because it's stinking hot. Um, talk about the weather. But then you could ask the question, what did you enjoy learning about God's grace today? And ask a question that will lead a person to savour Christ. Yeah? To delight in Jesus. What did you enjoy learning about Jesus today? What fueled your love for Jesus today? Now, if that feels like a weird question, I just want to say, get over it, love your brother and sister and ask them. Yep. Tonight, if you're a family, you're sitting with your kids at the table, ask them. And now they've been primed. So kids, you need to have an answer for this. What did you learn about being a disciple of Jesus today? It can happen at conversations at work. A friend at work, they're not a Christian, they don't really care about Christianity, but they share something that's really hard in their life. Why don't you say, do you know, I'm a Christian and I love Jesus. Would you mind if I pray for you tonight? Is that okay? That's just moving a person one step to the right. Speaking the truth in love. There is, there is a Jesus who you can pray to. A Christian friend is making a decision. Big decision for them. Why not suggest, let's read the last part of Luke 12 together. I don't have the answers, but let's just read the last part of Luke 12 together and then think and pray together about what does it mean to seek first God's kingdom. Let's do that. Speak the truth in love. You turning up to church contributes to the making of disciples. 
Because one, it raises a flag to the community around that there's a whole bunch of Jesus freaks here. Actually, can I quickly tell you a funny story? Joel, last week, uh, we had the baptism and I asked for a volunteer to go to the waterhole and mark out a place for us. Um, well, I didn't quite expect it to happen this way. Uh, Joel went down there and there's a bunch of people there and he just kind of rocked up and he said, hey, there's a whole bunch of Jesus freaks that are about to rock up and they're going to baptise someone. And they're like, oh. And a lady asked him, oh, are they baptising a baby? And he said, no, an adult. And an adult? Yeah, so they cleared out. Um, yeah. You turning up to church contributes to the making of disciples. And it encourages others to see that you are here and that you value Christ. It encourages them to value Christ. Going to growth group. What an awesome way to speak the truth of God, the truth of his grace, into the lives of people. It's, it's on tap. It's right there. And you can do it on the Tuesday night because everything that's Christian happens on a Tuesday night. Or you can follow it up during the week. You can send them a text and say, hey, I'm still thinking about what we learned on Tuesday night. What, what are you thinking about that? You see, that's contributing. And that's something we can all do. Ring up a friend during the week. Offer to pray for him. There are lots of ways that you can speak the truth of God into the life of man. Caring for someone who needs help. Demonstrating the love of Christ for them. It's something that you guys do incredibly well. There are lots of ways also that you can enable the speaking of God's word. Helping set up in the morning. We're building a team of people that can help set up. Playing an instrument enables the word of Christ to dwell amongst us richly. Christianity Explored when that comes on. Inviting people, providing yummy desserts. Do you see? Heaps of ways. And beneath all of this and through it all is prayer. Because at the end of the day, a person is a disciple of Jesus. And you want to ask him to be at work in the life of these people. So here's, here's another task for you. And I want you to do this. When you go home, I want you to pray for everyone who is here today that God in his kindness would take his words and set them alight in their hearts. The speaking of the truth in love is something that we want to be on about as a church. We want to be a Bible teaching, gospel hearted, people loving, prayerfully dependent church. We want the word of Christ to dwell amongst us richly. That pathway that we talked about before, we want to, over time, build and train people that can serve in each step of that pathway so that people can be moved across to the right. But in the meantime, if you feel like, well, I don't know where I fit in that path, you don't need to be bored in the Christian life. There are people around you. The person next to you is an eternal being with an eternal destiny and you have a role to play in them receiving Christ, learning Christ, loving Christ. And God has entrusted them to you today. Let's pray. Father God, we need your help in hearing what you're saying to us and to take responsibility for that which you've given to us to do. We thank you that you have given us this incredible task that we'll see something built which you value incredibly. We're sorry for the times that we don't value this, the way you value it. We 
we step back rather than step forward. We're sorry for the times when we presume upon your grace and don't let it stir us towards love and good deeds. Father, I want to pray for us as a church that we can be a body of people who speak the truth of Christ with love in lots and lots of different ways. But please give us courage to ask those simple questions about what we've learnt or what's encouraging us and help us to think creatively of the ways that we can serve one another in love. Lord, we pray that you would be at work amongst us making disciples of Jesus, seeing them grow, seeing them love you. We pray this in your name. Amen.